Welcome to Spotlight on Migraine, the professional series hosted by the Association of Migraine Disorders. Join us as we dive deeper into migraine topics with guests from the medical field. This episode includes educational content intended for medical professionals, but may be interesting to some patients as well. This episode is brought to you in part by our generous sponsors, Amgen and Novartis. Join us as Dr. Francine Tazard Romo presents evidence of the overuse of antibiotics for rhinosinusitis and provides guidelines on when they are appropriate and which options should be used in those cases. Since 2015, Amgen and Novartis have been working together to develop pioneering therapies in Alzheimer's disease and migraine. Together, Amgen and Novartis share in a mission to fight migraine and the stereotypes and misconceptions surrounding this debilitating disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the antibiotic treatment uh, use um, for renal sinusitis. So overall, antibiotics can be life-saving uh, drugs. However, um, we know that overuse of antibiotics are associated with uh, one of the most important life um, uh, public health threats, which is antibiotic resistance, in addition to increasing the risk of adverse events and unnecessary costs. 80% of antibiotic use are used in the outpatient setting, so that's where the money is. And um, in 2015, in the United States, 269 million antibiotic prescriptions were dispensed from outpatient pharmacies, meaning that four of every five people will receive an antibiotic prescription per year. And sinusitis was the most common single diagnosis for which an antibiotic was prescribed. So uh, data from the National uh, Ambulatory and Hospital uh, Medicare Survey have shown that rhinosinusitis is the single uh, lead to um, most of the antibiotic uh, prescriptions for ambulatory visits, uh, accounting for about 11% of those antibiotic prescriptions. Antibiotics were prescribed in about 85% uh, of acute rhinosinusitis ambulatory visits and 69% with those with chronic rhinosinusitis. In addition of, um, of knowing that antibiotics are overused in rhinosinusitis, in this cohort, for example, we can see from a sample of 184,000 uh, ambulatory visits, again, from the, uh, from the same um, uh, type of survey, 12.6% uh, of those visits resulted in ambulatory prescriptions in about five, uh, 506 prescriptions per 1,000 U.S. population annually. And they convene a group of experts that compared those prescriptions to national guidelines. And they um, were able to convene that only 70% th of those prescriptions were actually appropriate and 30% of those prescriptions were actually inappropriate. And among those with acute respiratory conditions, this number is even higher. 50% of those prescriptions are actually inappropriate. So we're not just seeing uh, inappropriate use of antibiotics, but also uh, more people are using more broader spectrum antibiotics to treat rhinosinusitis. In this study, from uh, approximately 1,700 uh, sample visits for sinusitis, we see that only first-line therapy, meaning uh, amoxicillin, penicillin, or amoxicillin with globulinate, was used as first-line therapy in only 50% of the cases. First-line therapy were prescribed more commonly in the pediatric population, though, than in the adult, adult population, and macrolide was the most common non-first-line antibiotic prescribed uh, for sinusitis. So we're over-prescribing, and we're, and additionally, we're giving antibiotics that are more broad spectrum than needed, and we're giving them as well for longer uh, duration. In this, uh, in this cohort, 3.7 million visits in which antibiotics were prescribed for sinusitis from the 2016 National Disease and Therapeutic Index, we can see that 46%, again, a pretty high number, received non-first-line uh, antibiotics, and most of them were prescribed uh, for 10 days or longer. So the median duration was 10 days, but 70% of those prescriptions were prescribed for 10 days or longer, and even higher rates for those that had a non-acetromycin uh, antibiotic prescribed. Despite having enough evidence as well from this, um, 
in, in this meta-analysis that included two, 12 randomized controlled trials, they didn't show any difference in clinical success when comparing short courses of treatment, three to seven days, compared to six to 10 days for acute renal sinusitis, with uh, definitely fewer adverse events as expected in the short course treatment group. So what do the guidelines currently recommend for treatment of antibiotic treatment for acute renal sinusitis? And we have currently the ENT guidelines from 2015 and the IDSA or Infectious Disease Society guidelines from 2012. So acute renal sinusitis is actually seldom, I mean, is not usually required for treatment of acute renal sinusitis. It's mostly um, recommended for acute bacterial renal sinusitis. So most of the cases of acute renal sinusitis are actually viral. In some cases that we do um, are concerned for bacterial renal sinusitis, which are basically those that have symptoms of renal sinusitis for less than four weeks, that's why it's acute, prolonged drainage, na plus nasal obstruction or facial pain or both, but that have symptoms that fail to improve for over 10 days or that are worsening symptoms within those 10 days after initial uh, improvement. And in those patients, you can either decide starting antibiotics right away or have what we call a watchful waiting, which is basically try to see if in a period of seven days, they do um, have um, resolution of symptoms on their own before starting antibiotics. But if they fail to improve, then you can consider starting antibiotics. Imaging is in acute renal sinusitis is really not necessary unless we're thinking about complicated uh, suspected cases, like for example, patients that have neurological symptoms or proptosis, facial swelling, then is, or the patient's immunocompromised, then you would uh, follow up with imaging. But most of the patients with acute renal sinusitis will not require antibiotics unless you're suspecting that they do have a bacterial uh, renal sinusitis. So what the guidelines recommend is using uh, amoxicillin or amoxicillin plus clavulinate as first-line therapy for five to 10 days. And uh, we do favor the use of amoxicillin with clavulinate, particularly uh, in the US, the rates of beta-lactamase um, beta inhibitors basically adds coverage for ampicillin-resistant haemophilus influenza, Marxocateralis. And here in the US, it's usually about 35 to 40%. Uh, high dose amoxicillin, meaning a two gram dosing, can be considered for patients or in areas where penicillin resistant uh, strep pneumo is suspected. And routine antimicrobial coverage for Staph aureus, meaning MRSA, even though they're colonized in acute renal sinusitis, is not recommended. And then in those patients that have penicillin allergy, uh, the alternative regimens are doxycycline, fluoroquinolones, third generation cephalosporins, plus eclindamycin. Macrolides and Bactrim are usually not recommended given high rates of resistance uh, uh, hemophilus influenza. So, um, and why is the watchful waiting? What is the, the evidence behind doing uh, watchful waiting? In this um, meta-analysis, what included 15 randomized controlled trials comparing antibiotic therapy versus placebo or no treatment, uh, where they recruited about uh, 3,000 uh, adults with acute renal sinusitis symptoms, most of them uh, without antibiotics improved within 14 days uh, of, of treatment. Only five to uh, 11 more people per 100 will be cured faster if they receive an antibiotic versus uh, placebo or no treatment. So the number needed to treat approximately to show improvement with an antibiotic in one individual will range between 11 to 15. However, that's, um, the risk is that more people are gonna experience side effects. So in chronic sinusitis, the role of antibiotics is even more controversial. As uh, most of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Mella had mentioned, you know, the, the chronic sinusitis is diagnosed basically based on the presence of two to four cardinal symptoms, meaning pearl and drainage, facial pain or pressure, nasal obstruction or decreased the sense of smell for 12 or more weeks, plus an objective evidence of sinus inflammation, usually most commonly uh, CT uh, of the sinus or direct uh, endoscopically visualization of that inflammation. And the goal of the treatment of chronic sinusitis is to control that inflammatory process, to decrease the edema, uh, promote that sinus drainage and eradicate infection if present. But chronic, 
chronic renal sinusitis doesn't really, uh, it's not equivalent that there is an infection presence. Given of the chronic uh, inflammatory process that it's going on, the, yes, there can be decrease of the um, blood flow in the area and potentially overgrow of bacteria in the, in the area, particularly anaerobes, but that doesn't mean that patients with chronic sinusitis are going to improve with antibiotics. Just in the cases where they have acute bacterial exacerbations in the process of chronic sinusitis. So the treatment is really a multidisciplinary approach, selling irrigations, intranasal steroids, uh, with or um, uh, systemic steroids, uh, particularly in the cases where sanal polyposis, uh, antibiotic treatment for acute bacterial exacerbations, the management of comorbidities, as much of uh, our colleagues have mentioned, asthma, allergies, cystic fibrosis, immunodeficiencies, and then con uh, consider surgery in the cases that are appropriate. Again, the data does suggest that, um, that when we compare systemic antibiotics in the cases of chronic renal sinusitis with placebo, uh, only one study, there's very limited evidence that really antibiotics make a difference in chronic renal sinusitis. There's one study uh, in patients without polyposis that they were treated with a microlide, roxithromycin, for 12 weeks versus placebo, and they only saw a modest improvement in disease-specific quality of life uh, utilizing the SNOT scale uh, with the microlide. In addition, there is a other randomized controlled trial in patients with and without polyposis treated with a, with a macrolide plus other interventions so, such as saline irrigation and international corticosteroids compared to placebo, and they didn't really show any difference in patient reported severity among uh, both groups. So what the guidelines recommend in chronic sinusitis is if you are considering that this patient has a, um, a bacterial um, infection on top of their chronic symptoms, then you can include an antibiotic that has anaerobic coverage, and there is uh, increased prevalence for staph aureus, particularly in those patients that are colonized, and Pseudomona uh, aeruginosa. Again, we recommend a short course of antibiotics, usually less than three weeks. There have been studies comparing different types of antibiotics in the treatment of chronic sinusitis, including cephalosporins, amoxicillin with clavulonate, and ciprofloxacin, uh, without any difference in outcomes between the three. And uh, there's insufficient evidence to recommend long-term microlytes uh, in the use of chronic sinusitis. Uh, so talking about three months of therapy. Uh, consider just, in, just there has been one study where doxycycline potentially improved polyp score symptoms in patients with chronic sinusitis with polyposis when treated at 12 weeks. And then consider different class of antibiotics if the patient has used antibiotics within the last three months, so if they already use a uh, amoxicillin with global and consider a different alternative, and consider sinus aspirate cultures in those patients to guide therapy. So why are, why are we overusing antibiotics and overprescribing antibiotics in sinusitis? So a few of the reasons is clinician knowledge gaps and experience managing uh, uh, sinusitis. Um, that leads to diagnostic uncertainty and overdiagnosis of sinusitis, as we were talking about, sinusitis has a broad differential diagnosis and not necessarily if the patient comes in with facial pain is sinusitis. Um, sometimes even the guidelines, you know, for example, there's no clear guidelines of who are the patients that are the best candidates for watchful waiting and then controversies in treatment as we discussed um, in, in the case of antibiotics and chronic sinusitis. Also trying to meet the patient expectations. Most of the time when patients present to the clinic, they do want an antibiotic prescription. Um, and that's what they're expecting, and the physician's perception of what is going to uh, satisfy the patient in the visit. Prescriber time pressure, so it's sometimes easier to just prescribe an antibiotic than really do further evaluation or questions. And then availability to follow up in care in those patients particularly that have, uh, that you're thinking about doing watchful waiting. If you cannot follow up to see if their patients improve, if the symptoms improve, obviously it's a, it's a caveat. So, you know, as an infectious disease specialist, obviously, um, I'm here to promote antimicrobial stewardship and try to decrease the use of antibiotics uh, in the cases of sinusitis. In 2016, the CDC um, published the core elements for outpatient antimicrobial stewardship. For, so for those of you that have outpatient practices and in primary care, these are things that you can implement in your practices. So basically have commitment from the physicians and from the administration as well uh, to strongly encourage stewardship. 
have action for policy and practice, track those, um, those interventions and see if they're really making a, an impact in the antibiotic prescribing and report them, and education and expertise. Some of those interventions are, could be easy, such as education, not just educate uh, the clinicians, but also educate the patients and the parents of those patients in, pediatric patient, in the pediatric practices. Uh, audit the clinicians and um, have feedback to those clinicians of how their antibi um, um, antibiotic prescribing uh, practices. Use rapid diagnostics, for example, you know, rapid strep, uh, PCRs, uh, set rate, CRP, um, RPPs, um, rapid flus. All those are useful in making decisions in the in the in the outpatient practices and communication training, train your physicians of how to really talk to the patient about not needing an antibiotic and that they're not upset about it. Uh, electro electronic decision support and guidelines from your clinics or from the Department of Health and try to do more watchful, um, what more delay prescriptions in, and, uh, instead of right away prescribing antibiotics. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Spotlight on Migraine. For more information on migraine disease, please visit migrainedisorders.org.